Welcome again, everyone. This is a review of the basics for molecular biology and diagnostics, part two. Let's now talk about the eukaryotic chromosome. Eukaryotes have multiple chromosomes, and these chromosomes are located inside the nucleus of the cell. The nucleus is also surrounded by a nuclear membrane. What are chromosomes though? So DNA inside the nucleus are bound to basic proteins called histones. So if this is the DNA, they would be wrapped around proteins called histones and this will form the nucleosomes. Compacted nucleosomes will form the chromatin fiber or the chromatin and chromatin will then form the chromosome. Humans have 46 chromosomes, and each one have two pairs, and we call this condition as diploid. There are two forms of chromosomes. We have the somatic and the sex chromosomes. There are 22 pairs of somatic chromosomes numbered from 1 to 22, and for sex chromosomes, we have X and Y. Double X for female, and XY for male. Eukaryote genes have exons and introns. The main difference between these two is that exons are the coding regions, while the introns are the non-coding regions. For you to remember this, exon is for expressed sequences, because they have the codes needed to make the proteins, while introns are the intervening sequences because it's like they just interfere with the whole process. They do not have the codes needed. Exons are well conserved. That means that the nucleotide sequence do not vary among the different individuals uh, in the species, while introns may contain some regulatory or transcriptional elements, and they may also have other functions. 25% of human genes have multiple allelic forms, and we call this as polymorphism. What is an allele? An allele is defined as a different form of a gene. So in other words, these are just different gene variations. And the next term that you have to remember is loci, which is the physical location of a gene. So this is just the position of the gene on where it may be found in the chromosome. Our next topic is about the human mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell which is located inside the cytoplasm. Although DNA is packed as chromosomes inside the nucleus, there is a few amount of DNA found inside a mitochondria. And these DNA inside the mitochondria are what we call as the mitochondrial DNA, abbreviated as mtDNA. In humans, mtDNA is a double-stranded circular molecule which is inherited maternally. They have around 16,600 base pairs. That means they contribute a small amount or a small fraction of the total DNA inside the cell, since inside the nucleus are billions of base pairs, inside the mitochondria are only 16,600 base pairs. There are a total of 37 genes found in the mitochondrial DNA, and all of these are used for mitochondrial function. 13 of these genes provide information for the creation of enzymes used in the oxidative phosphorylation process, which create ATP. The remainder of the genes are used to make molecules like transfer RNA and ribosomal RNA, which are chemical cousins of DNA used for protein synthesis. For diagnostic purposes, the hypervariable regions 1 and 2 are routinely sequenced for forensics. 
Let's now go to prokaryotic chromosomes. So prokaryotes do not have a nucleus and do not have a nuclear membrane. The chromosome just floats around inside the cell. And this chromosome is usually arranged in a circular manner. 95% of the chromosome has coding sequences, while 5%, only 5%, have non-coding sequences. Let's now talk about plasmids. So what are plasmids? These are extra chromosomal DNA, abbreviated as EC DNA, extra chromosomal, because these are DNA found off the chromosome or not included in the chromosome of the prokaryote. That is why they can replicate independently and they can also be passed down from one generation to another. ECDNA contain non-essential genetic information, but that does not mean that they are insignificant because the plasmids contain the antibiotic resistant genes. And these are important because they confer the resistance to different kinds of antibiotics, making the organism stronger. Our next topic would be two processes used in molecular techniques. DNA is double-stranded in form, and the process of disrupting this form is called denaturation. The product of denaturation would be denatured or melted DNA, which are single-stranded. Denaturation may be accomplished by either heating or by adding chemicals. Now, although there are different requirements for denaturation with different species, for human DNA to be denatured, it is usually done at 94 degrees Celsius. The next process is renaturation or annealing, which is the complete opposite of denaturation. Renaturation is the association or the putting together of single-stranded DNA or RNA to become a single molecule of double-stranded DNA. Another term given to this is hybridization. There are two requirements for renaturation, and that is salt and temperature. There should be an increased salt content for it to withstand or to overcome the electrostatic repulsion between the negatively charged phosphate group present in the two strands. The temperature for annealing human DNA is usually done at 52 degrees Celsius. Our last topic would be about nucleases and restriction enzymes. Nucleases are a variety of enzymes that are used to cleave off or to break phosphodiester bonds in nucleic acids. There are three types or three classes of nucleases. We have the deoxyribonucleases, ribonucleases, and exonucleases. The deoxyribonucleases or the DNases may either act on a single-stranded DNA or a double-stranded DNA. But there are other DNases that can act on both SSDNA and DSDNA. Ribonucleases or RNases are ubiquitous or are found mostly everywhere, and they have a high concentration on the hands. That's why it's important to wear gloves when you are working with RNA in the laboratory. They also act at a wide range of temperature, starting from negative 20 degrees Celsius up to more than 100 degrees Celsius. And lastly, exonucleases only cleave nucleic acids one at a time, either at the three prime or at the five prime end of a DNA or an RNA molecule. Lastly, we have the restriction enzymes or the endonucleases. These types of enzymes would recognize specific base sequence. So let's say, for example, a restriction enzyme would recognize this sequence, which is GAATTC, and it will make a cut near the recognized sequence or within the sequence itself. It would also make two cuts, one on each strand, 
producing a 3 prime and a 5 prime terminus. It's a 3 prime hydroxyl and a 5 prime phosphate terminus. Star activity is a term given when there is nonspecific cleaving, which usually happens when incubation temperatures are not optimal. An example of restriction enzymes would be the type 2 restriction enzymes, which cuts at predictable sites. It has its greatest utility with recombinant DNA experiments. The sequences recognized by type 2 restriction enzymes are palindromes. That means the sequences are bilateral symmetry. If from 5' prime to 3', prime, the sequences are GAATTC. That means on the other end, from 5' prime to 3', prime, the sequences would also be GAATTC. In diagnostics, the restriction fragment length polymorphisms, or the RFLPs, are used for the diagnosis and screening of hereditary diseases, but it is also used in forensics and criminology. The fragments taken from this may be viewed using the fluorescent stains in electrophoresis systems. Examples of these fluorescent stains would be ethidium bromide and SYBR green. And that wraps up our review of the basics for molecular biology and diagnostics. Hope you learned a lot. Thank you very much for watching.